Hey, this is Thomas Q. Jones, former UVA All-American running back, and you're listening to The Jerry Ratcliffe Show. Wahoo wah. Welcome to the show. Chris Graham here. We're waiting for Jerry Ratcliffe. We've got Ben Vanderplas here on the show with us as uh, Virginia is getting ready for Virginia Tech this weekend in Blacksburg. Ben, thanks for joining us here on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Hey, I got I to gotta ask, um, uh, when you came to Virginia, uh, when you made that decision last spring to come to UVA, did you think you'd be playing the five spot? <laughs> um, not not as much as I as I am. No, definitely that's a, a little bit different than than what we expected. But you know, uh, it's it's been working a little bit, so it's been fun to play some five. So uh, you know, I know you've talked about how strength and conditioning, uh, the work you've done with Coach Curtis has helped. Uh, you know, beef you up a little bit, get you stronger in the post. Uh, you know, I know that you, when you came to Virginia, you know, certainly your reputation as a, a forward, a, a, sp- a shooter, a guy who can stretch the floor, but talk about what it's like playing against some of these big guys in the ACC in the post and, and, and how you've been able to adjust. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest thing is probably defensively. Um, cause I, I've guarded fives in the past, you know, playing at Ohio. Um, but Mac fives and ACC fives are, are just a little bit, a little bit different in terms of just the, just the size. And so, um, you know, we have a couple of different things when I'm guarding some bigger fives that, that like to like to post ups things, post traps, uh, choking it out with the guards, just things like that. Um, but yeah, uh, coming into UVA lost some weight because I was playing the five at Ohio cause was, uh, looking to play a little bit more four. Um, and even talked about a little bit of like maybe some three, but you know, here we are back at the five again. So, um, yeah, just continuing to work with coach Curtis, making sure we stay strong and, um, just so I can bang around in there with the, with the big guys in the ACC. What do you think about what coach Bennett's been able to do to adjust the offense? You know, obviously taking advantage of, of your skills, but also, you know, Reese Beekman, Kia Clark, Armand Franklin. I mean, it really seems like things are really opening up, uh, and, and you guys have a great offensive flow going right now. Yeah, um, I think we have just a lot of a lot of pieces offensively that guys can score in a lot of a lot of different ways. Um, we can we can do a lot of different things on offense, and I think it's showing a little bit just with the the different lineups we can go out there with, um, the different kind of schemes we're we're throwing out there in terms of what we're running on offense, um, who's getting the ball where. Just there's a whole bunch of things that we can do with. Um, a lot of a lot of really skilled guys offensively so it's been fun to see uh, you know the coaching staff's creativity in terms of um, you know what they want to do against a certain team but yeah it's it's definitely been it's definitely been fun Uh, you talked about some of these the the bigger guys the bigs in the ACC the other night Jesse Edwards uh, had a had had some some run there late in the first half a little bit in the second half um, you know, one of the features of the pack line defense is those post to post doubles. I mean, I know it. So it's when we give you credit or we give anybody individually credit on the UVA defense, we know that there's a lot of team defense aspect to that. But, um, you know, what you were able to do against Jalen Williams in the uh, North Carolina game, you know, there's a lot of help that you guys give each other out there. How important is that uh, to, to to your game? And, and then how do you play into that, um, knowing what you have to do to help your teammates out? Yeah. Um, so like you said, um, it's really, really a team defense thing. Um, we have a lot of individually talented guys defensively, like Reese and Kihei are unbelievable. Um, Armand and JG, both unbelievable. We have just a lot of talented defensive guys too, but you throw all that together, um, just get in the gaps. And like you said, the the double teams, um, just uh, the way that we're able to communicate and just kind of mesh out there defensively. Um, we can we can do a lot of different things, whether it be more of a, a one-on-one with a choke it out of the post or a double team, and then you know guys just being able to guard the ball. So kind of like you said, it's just that team effort that really really keeps us going. I, I, and I know that the summertime is a long time ago now, but how important? I mean, you know, now looking back, it's February. We're getting close to March Madness. How important was that trip to Italy in terms of bonding? I mean, you're you were a newcomer coming in. There were a lot of guys who had been around the program for a while. I know there were the freshmen coming in too, but how important was it for you and maybe those freshmen to to you know get to learn your teammates, get to know your teammates better? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh the first part of that is obviously the basketball part. So you get 10 practices and then you go play four games and and you get to, you know, kind of start to play a little bit. Obviously, you can't do a ton in those 10 days in the four games, but you get to get to know the guys a little bit. I think the bigger part for me, and I think for the younger guys too, was just spending the time with the guys. Um just doing all the things that we did in Italy, all the restaurants, the things we saw, um, 
getting getting in the in the in the water, you know, swimming, doing all the fun stuff. Like I think just the bonding experience um was the biggest piece for us because you know, we had a, yeah, four, four first years and then me. Um, so just a lot of new guys uh and spending time, I think it was 10 total days over there um with the whole team, um, some people's families, the coaches, like it was just a really, really good experience to to really get to know everybody and and spend a lot of time um, with the team. October, as practice is picking up, it's it's got to be competitive. There's a lot of talent on in that in that organization. There, um, could you talk about how you know the practices uh, leading up to the start of the season in November? How how that forged the team, but also, I mean, you guys are are getting better by playing against you know the the talent that's there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like you said, there's a lot of guys uh, that can play here, so. Um, just going through uh, preseason practices, a lot of different like lineups, five on five stuff, um, just a, like a lot of mixing and matching. Um, there's a lot of versatility and a lot of guys. So um, just going against, you know, different guys uh, every other day and and just continuing to to compete against each other. Um, I know it it helped me tremendously, like having to guard, um, having to guard Armand some days, having to guard uh, JG some days, having to guard Poppy some days, um, just really switching it up and and. I'm challenging myself and and being in the, in those spots where I have to get better and and continue to 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 fight against these guys and compete with them every day. So I think just the the depth on the team um really really helped us out in those preseason practices just um going against really really tough competition every single day. Um you're you're going to keep getting better. So that was definitely beneficial for us. I know that uh, as an observer of this program for the last several years um Coach Bennett, picked, he, he he put together a really challenging non-conference schedule for you guys. Um, I, I, I would wonder what your thoughts were going into the season when you saw that schedule. And then just how did playing those games, I mean, playing all those tough games early on, get you guys ready for the ACC? Yeah, I know uh, during the recruiting process, they they talked about the, um, the, the event in Vegas that they were going to, um, playing those two games there. Um, those, those were two really, really high level games at the start of the season really really early in the season so um really fun challenges and then obviously the Michigan game was a good one um played Houston we played a lot of really really good teams early and um you know that's what you want to do that's that's how you get better that's how you kind of see where you're at that's how you see what you need to improve on um so those challenges early I think really really are helping us out right now um and yeah th- those games um some great memories those are really really fun games to to play in and I'll be able to look back on those for a long time and and just kind of enjoy those memories so uh, the preseason and uh non-conference schedule is really really fun I know the MAC is a tough mid-major conference so I'm not and, and it, obviously you guys played Virginia in the tournament a couple years ago and, and were able to pull the upset so um but com- you know looking at the ACC now this is your first run and your your run through the ACC this year um, how has it been for you to adjust to the night in night out? There's, there's no easy games. There's no layups in the ACC schedule. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and that's something that I really, really like about, uh, you know, college basketball is every single night you gotta, you gotta come out and you gotta play. Um, it's, it's a challenge every single time. So, um, no matter who we're going up against, uh, it, coach Bennett does a really, really good job of preparing us and making sure that, you know, we're focused, regardless of who we're playing. So that's something that's really helped us. And I think the experience on the team, we have a lot of older guys who have been through um, a lot of college basketball and a lot of seasons, and they've seen how like you, you can, you can go up against a team that might not be playing as well and they could have a really, really good game. So um, just the preparation that we put into every single game, regardless of who we're going up against, I think is something that's benefiting us um, a ton right now. Uh, what is your what have your teammates who have played at Virginia Tech told you about that environment? I've been down there for games. It is not an easy environment for some teams, especially teams that were orange and blue to play in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, everybody's talked about it. Uh, just it's it's a it's a fun game. Um, you know, they're they're fans. They get a lot of fans that are that are passionate and um, they got it. Just they talk about how loud it gets in there. Um, so those are the those are the spots you want to be in that's those are enjoyable games um and once you game between the lines you know that stuff kind of goes goes out it's it's you're just playing basketball it's 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 really just going back to what you know and and sticking to what you do so um the the environment it's it's definitely going to be a fun one and i'm looking forward to it
those fans can be brutal. I'll, I'll, I'll give, I'll give my two cents on that uh, <laughs> as well. Um, so last question, um, I, my wife would, would kill me if I didn't ask this question about the mustache. Where did the idea for the mustache come from and what's the response been from people around you, like family, anything like that? Yeah. Um, so it goes back to um, during quarantine, right when COVID happened, um, me and my brother both, um, he was a graduate assistant at Illinois State on the women's side at the, at the time. And so I was at Ohio. Uh, conference tournament gets canceled. I hop in the car, start driving home. My brother calls me. He's like, hey, come pick me up. Like, I'm coming home too. And we're thinking we're only going to be there for a couple of weeks, but we ended up being there for however many months it was. Um, so we were just home. My brother started growing his mustache and I was like, you know what? I'm not leaving the house anytime soon. I got nobody to impress. Like, I'm just going to grow my mustache and see what it looks like. So I got to give, uh, give the credit to my brother, um, for that one. I kind of followed in his footsteps. And then last season it was on and off a little bit, went with like a beard, clean shaven mustache, but then the mustache started to stick towards the end of the season. And, you know, we've just kind of, kind of rolled with it ever since. I'm sure you're busy during games doing other things like listening to Coach Bennett and the other coaches. But <laughs> I notice on the big screen they have they'll they'll flash occasionally. There's fans wearing mustaches in honor of Ben. I mean, uh, you may may have seen pictures mm -hmm. of that somewhere. What what does that make you think? The people are out. There, I mean, they're, they're, they've picked up on this. Man, I'm the the biggest thing is I'm just so so thankful to be in this spot. Like I, I I've met some kids after the last game who they had my shirts with the mustache and the hair and the headband. They had their own orange headbands with little fake mustaches and like. That's that's it's awesome. Um, I love that stuff. And I'm just really, really thankful that, you know, people have accepted me here and 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 uh, are supporting me. So um, just a huge shout out to everybody who's who's kind of hopped on the mustache train. It's it's been it's been a lot of fun. And I'm I'm really, really thankful for those people. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Ben, for your time. Good luck uh, down at Virginia Tech uh, uh, and, and the rest of the season as well. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Looking for a great dining experience in Charlottesville? Look no further than the Aberdeen Barn. The barn has been family owned and operated since 1965, with Terry and Angela providing great atmosphere and mouth-watering food at Virginia's Big Time Steakhouse. Enjoy the fine dining or relax in the Sportsman's Bar, a fantastic place to wind down and socialize, surrounded by flat screen televisions Tune to the latest sporting events. You never know who you might bump into at the Aberdeen Barn, where all the greatest Cavaliers have dined over the decades and keep coming back for the delicious menu and good times. Check it out online at AberdeenBarn.com or call 434-296-4630. Hi, it's Jonathan Cotton with the Good Feet Store. As a lifelong runner, the pain in my feet was debilitating. Finally, I went into the Good Feet Store and found the answer personally fit art supports. They helped me so much I ran my first marathon that year. Then because I believed in the Good Feet system so much, I bought the store. I'm so happy to offer my hometown community the opportunity to find relief from foot, knee, and back pain. The Good Feet store is located in the shops at Stonefield near Trader Joe's. Book your appointment today at goodfeet.com. This is Chris Slade, former University of Virginia defensive end, graduate of 1993. Back on the staff at UVA, excited to be back coaching um, my old stomping grounds. You're listening to the Jerry Ratcliffe Show. Welcome back. Uh, we just talked with Ben Vanderplas here on the show, Chris Graham, Jerry Ratcliffe. Boy, we had some technical issues, but at least we got Ben uh, and, and talking about basketball, his mustache, all kinds of fun stuff. Jerry, um, uh, Ben's a quite delightful young man, and, and this basketball team uh, has been a joy to watch the last few weeks. Seven-game winning streak, one of the hottest teams in the country. And uh, heading down to Virginia Tech on Saturday with a chance to, you know, maybe uh, you know, continue the streak, but also climb climb even higher in the ACC standings. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I missed that part of the show. Um, I had some technical problems. And, um, yeah, I, I enjoy Ben Vanderplas. What a, what a great kid he is. And uh, what a great season he's having. Um, you're right. Uh, Saturday looms large. Uh, Virginia is now – half a game behind Clemson in the ACC standings and uh, in hot pursuit of winning another regular season uh, title, which would uh, bode well for them in the seedings for the postseason for not only the ACC tournament, but also the uh, NCAAs. And uh, Virginia Tech, of course, uh, won't be an easy game. I mean, the Hokies are playing well. Um, 
they're hard to beat at home, even though they I think they dropped a home game just the other day. Uh, if memory serves. Um, maybe they didn't. I don't know. I'm, no, their, their, their loss was at Miami. They they actually right. yeah. yeah, they've beaten they've beaten Carolina and Duke at home this year. <laughs> yeah, I, I've watched so many games lately. I can't yeah. keep up with all of them, but uh, but they're tough to beat at home, and uh, they'll give Virginia a run for their money for sure. They're especially tough against teams uh, like Virginia, Duke, and North Carolina. Um, they they might not get the attendance for other games, but when the big games come in, those those students come out. And Jerry, you've been to a number of games there over the years. I've been to games over the, there over the years. Uh, the the visiting team in the second half shoots into the student section. And that stadium is built the way Castle Coliseum is built. It's almost like those seats go straight up behind the basket. And uh, those kids are like, it's like they're hanging over the backboard. Uh, they're so close. Um, it's a wall of sound. It's, it's, it can be hard to see when you're shooting free throws. So, I mean, yeah, it's, it, it's tough for, it's tough for really good teams against maybe, you know, tech teams that haven't been good in the past. This is a decent tech team. Offensively, they're they're close to elite. Defensively has been where their issue's been this year, but um, they played Virginia really well back a couple of weeks ago in Charlottesville. So it's definitely going to be a contest for these twos. Yeah, they really did, and that was uh, Hunter Couture's first game back after being missing uh, uh, at least four games, maybe more, um, with an injury. And uh, he played well in his first game back, as everybody expected him to. Uh, and uh, I mean, gosh, what can I say? Mike Young does a great job. He had a great plan, uh, game plan for Virginia. Uh, the Cavaliers just were playing lights out that night, and um, I expect nothing less down in Blacksburg. It'll be a hostile environment, and I'm sure Tech would like to avenge that loss to Charlottesville. And like I said, they're they're awfully hard to beat at home. Well, and that so tech it team, should be a great game. That Tech team is three and eight in the <laughs> ACC. Um, they really can't afford any more hiccups and this is the last chance for the Hokies to get a quad one win of you know, Virginia playing on the uh, there at in their place is, is one of their it might be their last chance at a quad one win um, for their NCAA tournament resume the Hokies that is so um, you know looking back earlier this week for Virginia um, the win over Syracuse the other night uh, I was texting our colleague Scott German and after the game was over I said this one should count as more than one win it just felt like um, there was a lot in that game for Virginia to have to overcome and, uh, you know, the Edwards kid went off, um, you know, the, 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 that big rally for, for Syracuse, that 12 0 run in the second half, it felt like that game was in Syracuse's hands. And then Tony Bennett figured something out and, and got you know, in the last seven minutes, got his team to, to, you know, play some really good defense. I think Syracuse finished three of 12 from the floor in the last, uh, 12 minutes of the game, actually. Um, and, um, Virginia gutted out that win, but it was not easy at all. No, it wasn't, and uh, yeah, it should count as more than one win because uh, Syracuse plays well at home, and uh, Jim Beheim, uh, again, just like Mike Young did, had a great game plan for Virginia. He, he had he he got everything he wanted in that game except for execution. Um, he knew that Virginia was going to have to double Edwards. Uh, they tried not to do it in the first half, and Syracuse – burned them for 26 points in the paint. And so Tony Bennett had to double Edwards most of the second half, and Syracuse ended up, ended up with only 10 points in the second half in the paint. But that opened up other guys, and that's what Bayham wanted. He, he wanted them to double Edwards so they could get the ball out on the wings to their shooters. But they uh, they didn't shoot well. I think they had three out of 15 three-point attempts. And as as he said uh, in his post game against a team like Virginia, you can't shoot three of 15 when you get open shots and miss them uh, against a, a number six or seven team in the country. And he was right. And they, they also missed seven free throws. Um, which would have been a difference in the game as well. But, uh, you know, he, he moved his – he, he uh, tinkered with his own defense a little bit because he knew that Virginia had, had great success uh, getting the ball to somebody in the high post and letting them distribute it to the open shooter 
and they had been using Kihei Clark in that role the last few games against Syracuse. Um, Bayheim made it harder for Kihei, who's 5'9", even though they say he's 5'10 now, but um, they used a little more height up front in the zone and took that uh, high post uh, away from Kihei and had to put Ben Vanderplas in that spot, who's bigger and was able to see over the zone a little bit more. So Bayheim, uh, <laughs> he... He's a Hall of Fame coach. He, he's no dummy. He found uh, some ways to attack Virginia and got his way with it. Uh, his team just didn't execute the way it needed to in order to pull off the upset. And Vanderplas adjusted well, too. Seven points would yes. make you think, hey, he didn't have a good game. But he had six assists in the game. Um, and uh, he was finding open shooters. Uh, Virginia was knocking down some shots, at least, um, on the side. Yeah, three of 15. Tony, Tony Bennett even acknowledged um, we got a little, you know, he didn't, he didn't use the word lucky, but you know, they missed some shots and, and sometimes that happens. Sometimes you miss some open shots and that's what Syracuse was doing. Uh, unfortunately for them consistently in that second half. Um, and so, yeah, B- Jaden Gardner's had a couple of nice games lately. Uh, I had been, uh, <laughs> writing, uh, columns and notebook columns and everything else where I was suggesting that Ryan Dunn, who's been playing so well, the freshman stealing minutes at the four spot from Jaden Gardner might end up being the starter. Um, Gardner has responded well last two games, the, uh, Boston college game. And, uh, I think he had 16 in that one. He had 17 against Syracuse. The, uh, the veteran has responded well, uh, the last couple times out. He's played well. Uh, and Armand Franklin has, uh, been con- really consistent, uh, on offense. Well, overall really, but, uh, on offense, he's been, uh, on fire really. I mean, he's, He's he's been shooting lights out, and and uh, as we've said on this show many times over the past several weeks, for Virginia to be all that they want, uh, to get where they want, they need Franklin to have that consistency. And and man, he has answered the bell. He's delivered, and he has shot well. The fact that Gardner is stepping up only makes them that much more dangerous because, I mean, he's automatic with that 15-foot shot, no matter where it is on the floor, it seems. If you've got both those guys consistently scoring, uh, that makes Virginia an awfully hard team to beat, especially with Vanderplas, who can get hot and light it up, as he's he's done a few times. Bigman attacking the basket, uh, Kihei uh, making some nice shots, uh, driving the ball as Bigman has, uh, Dunn contributing here and there, and McNeely uh, deadly on that three-point line. He's he's shooting around 55% over the seven-game winning streak. Right now, Virginia is a very, very hard team to beat, and it's going to take a heck of an effort. Uh, or either that or they're going to have to beat themselves. And right now they're not doing that. So um, the, their fate is in their hands. Fate is in their hands, right, uh, health-wise and everything else. Uh, and the schedule looks nice as, and, and favorable as well for the most part, at least the way it lays out. You know, it's funny. When I, talk to, when I talk to UVA fans or email or text with UVA fans, they'll tell me how much deeper this team seems to be this year and really, I mean, as, as someone like me who who studies the box scores, it's largely a seven man rotation. I mean, that, you know, you throw in the Caden Shedrick gets some minutes and Francisco Caffaro gets some minutes, but largely it's a seven man rotation. It's just that all seven of those guys can do so many things. You know, you, McNeely doesn't shoot it a lot, but he's fifty five percent from three the last seven games. Um, the two point guards. Most teams in the country would love to have one of Virginia's point guards, and we've got two of them in Charlottesville. Um, you've got a guy like Jaden Gardner, who led the team in scoring and rebounding last year, is getting less minutes this year because he's being pressed by that freshman Ryan Dunn. Um, you, you got the you know the transfer in Vanderplas, uh, who has really uh, just changed the chemistry of everything in a positive way. So, but it's, it's just funny. You know, last year's team, uh, Tony, uh, as the season went on, narrowed down to a seven-man rotation. He's down to a seven-man rotation now. It's just that all seven of these guys are dangerous guys. Yeah, and, uh, you know, and Shedrick, uh, as we had discussed on this show, I think last week, 
uh, stepped up when he was needed. Tony told him in front of the whole team uh, recently, I guess ap- before or after the Wake Forest game, that, hey, we're going to need you and, and Caffaro at, at various points as we head down the home stretch. Be ready. And Shedrick took that to heart. He came in and, and played well uh, against uh, the post guy from Boston College. Um who lit it up in the first half of that game and then uh, up there against Edwards the other night at Syracuse. So, um, I mean, that's Tony Bennett telling his guys, you know, you're going to, you're going to be needed. So be ready. And, and he answered the bell, but yeah, it's, it's a rather tight rotation and uh, pretty much all you need if everybody's doing what they're supposed to do. And uh I think he's tightened it up a little earlier this year than he normally would. Uh, usually he waits close to the end of the season or all the way into postseason before he narrows that lineup. And he, I think he's settled on things a little earlier this season. And that's a good sign because he knows, uh, I think he knows at this point who can deliver in what circumstances against what matchups and uh, eliminate some of the guessing game. He's got so many moving pieces that he can use uh, for different uh, matchups. I mean, he, he's talked about that too. The, the, the different he, he he's he's got a flexible team like he had back in 2019. Uh, you know, yes. not putting any pressure on this team, but th- this is this is his most um, the most moving pieces he can he can use uh, if, to play different styles of teams that he's had since that championship team. Yeah, and you know, um, Virginia was has uh, what. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, I guess eight games remaining in the regular season, uh, including this Saturday at, at Tech. Uh, probably the toughest portion of that is in the next week when they uh, play at Tech and then host NC State and Duke here within the next week. Uh, Tech, as we already discussed, is dangerous at home and, and playing well now that they're healthy. And then in NC State just tore Louisville up last night. I think it was 40 to 14 at one point. And uh, and Duke, obviously, is uh, some of those young players are starting to mature a little bit. But uh, the good part of that is that both of those games are at JPJ, where Virginia is uh, so hard to beat. So if they if they could somehow glide through those three games without a loss, wow that would speak volumes about this team. And if they drop one somewhere in there, it's uh, it's probably not so bad. Yeah. Not a surprise. He mentioned it. This next week is tough for these, for these Cavaliers. Uh, so um, we'll look forward to that. The tip on Saturday, another noon tip on a Saturday, uh, this one on the road down in Blacksburg. Um, it'll just mean we have to get up and at them a little earlier. And then uh, we have the rest of the day to ourselves. Uh, and then the two home games next week, Jerry, let's let's switch gears and talk some football. Uh, this week was the second part of National Signing Day for for football. Um, no signees for Virginia to announce. Uh, there was a lot of effort and some rumor that there may have been, you know, some some folks in the in the wings. But Coach Tony Elliott did meet with the media yesterday just to talk about uh, the state of things, I suppose, because since there were no signees, um, what were some of the highlights to you that you heard when you were there yesterday? Well, uh, I, I wanted to ask him about the quarterback situation with Wolfolk, uh, obviously being a pitcher on Brian O'Connor's uh, great baseball team and uh, how that was going to work out through the spring. And it turned out that uh, he and O'Connor were going to have that conversation later that day. So uh, we don't know what uh, the outcome of that was, but uh, pretty much he said that uh, Tony said that uh, he had he had uh, let O'Connor have first rights to Wolfolk uh, up until yesterday to evaluate, and uh, I guess O'Connor and his staff were trying to figure out whether Wolfolk would be a starting pitcher in the rotation or a closer, and which would largely depend. I uh, have a impact on, on how Tony can use him for spring football practice when it starts later on, I guess this month. Um, obviously if he's a closer, he'll be uh, 
could be used multiple times a week as opposed to a starter. So um, if he's a starter, he would probably be freed up for a little bit more football practice time. But uh, I think Tony Elliott would like to have him there for every practice possible um, and the classroom portions of, of that as well, because Wolfolk is going to, let's face it, he's going to be in a quarterback battle with uh, Tony Musket, who transferred in from Monmouth. And uh, it should be between those two. There's some other candidates, but uh, it would appear to boil down between those two, at least on paper. And Wolfolk doesn't have a whole lot of experience uh, other than at, at practice. So, um, I, I, th I thought that was uh, an important thing to address. He, he talked about losing Brandon Armstrong, said he had no regrets, um, or at least no, uh, reservations in, in him leaving. He understood that, you know, he wanted to see greener pastures, et cetera. Uh, same thing with wide receivers coach Marcus Higgins, that if he wanted to move on after 11 years in a program, which is what Tony did as an assistant to uh, Dabo Sweeney at Clemson to further his career, that uh, he wished him well. He said he didn't want Higgins to leave. Um, so um, those are changes. He talked a little bit about uh, Adam Mims, who will replace Higgins. Uh, he was on the staff last year as a uh, advisor, I guess. Um, he, he talked a little bit about, you know, just picking up the pieces from the tragedy and having the last two regular season games uh, canceled. Um, and that he was a little nervous about uh, the way things were going to be when everybody came back. And he says, we're not moving on, we're moving forward. And uh, he, he senses a little heightened sense of urgency. Um, uh, they're going to be wearing uh, patches as a tribute to the players uh, on their uniforms and helmets this season. And uh, I think I, I think I heard him right. He said that uh, whoever wears those players' jerseys, uh, I, I don't know if it'll be uh, on a game-to-game -game basis or, or something, but uh, that will also be some sort of a tribute. Uh, to the three players who have slain, that um, Mike Hollins uh, is going to be back. Uh, they said they will monitor monitor him closely as he competes for starting running back. Uh, there's still no decision on Nick Jackson as to whether he's going to accept a uh, scholarship through the transfer portal somewhere else. Uh, I've read where he supposedly he's leaning toward going to Iowa State, I think it was. Um, but uh, I guess he, he's still enrolled at Virginia, so he he could decide to come back here. Uh, certainly, Tony Elliott would love to have him back as part of that defense, which turned the corner last season. Um, Being enrolled at Virginia, too, would make I mean, he's not going to be able to play in the spring for whoever he would transfer to. That 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 gives Virginia an, incum an incumbency advantage as well. Yeah, and, uh, you know, he, he attended the team banquet uh, not long ago, a couple of weeks ago, and I think he was elected a team captain by the players, so uh, his teammates. So, you know, maybe there's a uh, – that door is still open, it seems. Um, I asked him about the schedule, and he talked about what a challenge that's going to be, opening up against Tennessee, essentially at Tennessee. It's in Nashville, but we all know that that's – it's a home game for Tennessee. Uh, and, and a part to be concerned with is the following game, they return home to play JMU, which has won 20 games over the past two seasons. And uh, probably, I would I would guess, that JMU will probably be favored in that game. They won eight games last year uh, in their first year in FBS. And, you yeah. know those folks have that game circled <laughs> on their calendar uh, uh, as a chance to make a statement, right? Absolutely. Uh, they want to make lay claim to being the best team in the state of Virginia. So 
that would be a, a chance to prove it. Um, and I, I think they, uh, I think uh, I, I can't remember the rest of the schedule off the top of my head. I know I think one of the first four games is at Maryland, I believe. At Maryland, yeah, and then and then the return of Brennan to Charlottesville on a Friday right. night. Yeah, I mean that's uh, that's that's a tough way to open the season. I'll even it. say the Wayman Mary game in October. Wayman Mary made the FCS playoffs last year. This Virginia team is is going to you know it's, it's going to have to work to win some games. I wouldn't even overlook Wayman Mary with Mike London coming back into Charlottesville. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, um, th- those were some of the things we touched on. Uh, yeah, you know, just some other odds and ends, but uh, th- that was probably the gist of of yesterday's uh, or Wednesday's. Well, yeah, it was yesterday. Wednesday it was, press conference. It seems like so long ago. I I, <laughs> I, I listened in, and it, yeah, it does. You know, he talked about the recruiting a little bit too, just about how he's got his uh, assistants knocking. He wants to have, uh, you know, someone knocking on every door, going to every high school in Virginia, making contact. Um, that's important because Virginia did not do so well, not only overall recruiting wise, but even within the state of Virginia. Um, but you know, they're they're laying their 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 inroads there. Talked about the impact of the um, uh, the the new facility that's coming online next year. And having, you know, but you can't just show the pretty new, the shiny new toy. He'll have a shiny new toy, I think is the way he put it. But you have to have more than that uh, to 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 have a successful program. So, I mean, yeah, recruiting is where it's at. You got to get the guys in there. Then you got to develop them. And uh, he talked about wanting to be a, a developmental program as well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they, they signed a, a handful of players from the state of Virginia in this recent recruiting class, which uh, Bronco Mendenhall failed to do in five of the six years he was here. Um, So that was a little progress. And uh, I know the previous year's signing day, uh, Tony talked about how uh, a lot of, a lot of those kids were, uh, had already made their decisions they were way down the recruiting trail by the time he and got here and and hired a staff. So uh, this time around, they've, they've got a a jump start. They they can get around to all the schools in the state and make some inroads. He said they've been received well by the high school coaches and that'll make a difference. uh, Recruiting is a lot about trust and um, building relationships. And I'm sure they're working hard trying to do that. Um, so that, you know, time will tell and, uh, the facility can help, uh, it's not going to be the determining factor. I think you still have to win to attract the good players. Uh, and that remains to be seen as well as to whether, uh, he can make progress in that area in his second year at Virginia. Yeah, and it's it, I, I I would stress to those listening how important this is, not just for winning you know in football, which is important in itself, but it's important for everything. If you're not a if you're not necessarily a big football fan, but you're a you know big UVA basketball fan or baseball fan, softball fan, whatever you are, the success of football determines how much money gets spent on other sports too. And so, you know, if if if, if and we've seen it, I mean, the football program is not drawing fans most Saturdays. Uh, this year we'll have a Friday a chance to have some fans come in. But if if there's lots of empty seats, that means that there's less money in the recruiting budgets, the travel budgets, uh, et cetera, for those other programs. So um, even if you don't pay close attention to football, you 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 want to see it do well because the success or lack of success there, it, it's felt all through that program. Oh, no, no question about it. I mean, that's the engine that drives the train and uh, it's that way everywhere. And Virginia is, is losing. I think we, we uh, estimated they're probably losing around a million dollars per home game um, because of the lack of attendance. And that that's a lot of money left on the table um, that could really help your program. And, uh, it also sends a message to recruits. I mean, if they go somewhere else and the place is full and rowdy and it's a great atmosphere and then they come here and the stands are half empty and the environment's just not as electric, then 
that's a turnoff to a lot of these young kids. They they don't want to they want to go somewhere where it's fun to play and where they can get noticed and that it's exciting and uh, an electric atmosphere and they have a chance to win games and compete against even better teams. And so uh, the crowd is, is part of it. And um, I mean, look at all the successful programs in the country and you, you, I've been to a lot of those stadiums around the country and uh, game day at those places. Uh, I mean, even an old man like me, <laughs> Uh, it gets to you. You're ready to suit up and, and run through a wall for to, to get out there on the field. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it, that means a lot. It's it's part of part of the game day, and um, it's 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 a it's a part that's missing at, at Virginia. And I, I don't know what the answer to that is, other than winning, Chris. Yeah. Because um, we've seen it that way here before. It's been a long time, but uh, we know it exists. We've seen it. We've been part of it. But how you get that back, uh, wow, that's uh, it's above my pay level. I think uh, it's somebody smarter than me is going to have to figure out how to get people back in the stands other than just the simple bottom line of racking up W's. I don't, I don't, I, I, I've done a story on this. It's been a while. It's, well, we're out of football season now, but the last time, if, if my, if my memory serves, the last time we had 60,000 plus in Scott stadium was the 2008 season opener against South Southern Cal uh, USC. Um, that's a long time. That's, you know, that's 50 going back 15 years now, since we've seen 60,000 in the stadium, it holds, it holds 61, uh, 61 five officially, but we had 64 for that game with all the people squeezing in on the Hill up there. So, um, I mean, yeah. And, and that's with, that's with some wins. I mean, the, the 2019 season, uh, Bronco Mendenhall got Virginia into the orange bowl, got him to the ACC championship game, orange bowl. And we still couldn't get 60 for the, uh, the Virginia Tech game that year. That game was the one that determined who went to the ACC championship game the next week. So, you know, even winning didn't necessarily do it that year. It's winning consistently, probably. You know, okay, you know, because UVA fans may be fickle enough to say, all right, good, you can do it once. Can you do it again? Um, so, you know, we've got to, we've probably got to retrain some people, um, got to win some games and then retrain the fans to say, Virginia football is worth my Saturday. Yeah, and, you know, people think I'm beating a dead horse because I've been saying this for years, and I, I don't know if UVA likes to blow it off and say, well, uh, people need to get over it, but it goes back to, the I think, that same year is when yeah. UVA decided um, because Southern Cal was coming in and they knew that they could fill up the stands, and I um I think part of their strategy was we get some really big time teams in here. If we can upset one of them and uh, it could do wonders for the program, but that's when they decided to redo the seating at Scott stadium. And they, uh, I, I don't think they treated some of their most loyal fans. Right. They, they essentially allowed people with more money to buy their seats, even though those people had stuck with them through thick and thin and a lot of thin uh, for decades. And they, some of those people were forced to give up their seats to people with, who were willing to spend more money uh, for those seats. And a lot of those people haven't forgotten that. A lot of them left, didn't renew their tickets, haven't been back to a game since. How you get those people back and re, uh, reward that loyalty? I don't know. That's uh, I, I, it might be ir irreparable damage. I, I don't. I don't know. Maybe, maybe they can find a way to get those people back. I don't know. Um, you know, we that's they, they got to do, do something, or, or you know, I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, but that's that still remains yeah. to be a problem, even though. The school seems to be in denial about that. Hey, they've been in denial. I agree with you, Jerry. That we, we, they called it reticketing at that time. Uh, 15 years ago, I mean, so we not only lost the people who got, you know, screwed out of their tickets, but then their kids um, also. I mean, so it's, it's, it's a generational thing now because season tickets are a generational thing. When, you, when you're a parent, you take you, your mom and dad, take the kids with them. And then when the kids get on, they get their own tickets or maybe they take the parents tickets over. They all go together. It, it, you go to games as a family and then you also don't go to games as a family. And so 
Yeah, and and the people who had the money to buy the tickets in 2008, you know, those folks who are st stuck through with through through thick and thin for 30, 40 years, these new folks didn't stick through thick and thin, and there was a lot of thin that they 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 didn't stick through. And so, yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those things where we lost, we've lost a generation of UVA fans, and now I think about the kids who come in now, uh, the students who come in now. When I was a student, I, I started at UVA in 1990. The first football game I attended as a student was the first win over Clemson. Um, I was already a UVA football fan before that, but if you weren't and you were at that game, you were a football fan forever afterwards. That was a memorable game. Um, the kids now that are going to UVA, the, whether you're a first year or a fourth year, they grew up in an era when UVA football was irrelevant. So, that's why we see when we look out there, we see from the press box, we look across the stadium, we see a, a nowhere close to full student section. So those kids aren't going to come back when they are alums because they're not coming as students. So there's there's a lot there's a lot there that is not working in a, in a good direction for for UVA football uh, now and into the future in that respect. Yeah, and uh, again, that, that's that's for the uh, the higher ups over there to figure out um, the the simple answer is to win, but that's not so easy either. I mean, <laughs> uh, you, when you look at Virginia football history, other than George Welsh and the early years of Al Groh, there hasn't been a lot of winning here in, uh, in generations. And, um, you know, when, when George Welsh was asked, uh, why would you come to a coach's graveyard? And he says, well, it's a, it's a lovely graveyard. Well, it is, but it has been a coach's graveyard and remains to, I mean, it's, you know, you can argue about it if you want to, but it has been a coach's graveyard um, except for George. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't have the answers for it. I, I don't know who does. I, maybe it's just, that's the way it is. Uh, I do remember that when John Oliver was associate AD and uh, we were talking about what what about Virginia football? I mean, what what's the deal? And he, he said, well, uh, and, and I quoted him on this, and he said that if we can win seven games a year, uh, I think that would satisfy people to a large degree. This might have been when we were playing 11, maybe not 12, but maybe not. I can't recall. But um, And then occasionally have a 9 or, or 10 win season and win or at least compete for the ACC title. And apparently one of the large boosters read that and threw a hissy fit and said, uh, if that's our goal, then I'm not giving you any more money because we want more than that. Well, what's it take to get more than that? I I, I don't know, but um, I, there's just so many unanswered questions, and I don't certainly don't have the answer to it. I'll, I'll, my thought is what the George Welsh era was defined by that the 11 game season, uh, seven wins. Uh, there were certainly plenty of people who were upset that we 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 were happy with that relatively low bar in some people's minds. The problem that I think exists and is never going to go away for UVA football is, and it's not the same basketball. Men's basketball is thirteen scholarships. Um, your rotation we just talked about seven or eight man rotation. Um, three or four of those guys, if, as long you know, if, as long as you have three or four guys who are elite and you have a couple guys around them, you got yourself a good basketball team. Football, the two deep. Uh, the, the, you know, starter and backup at every position, including the, 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 um, uh, special teams is 50 guys. Virginia is not going to ever admit 50 players that can compete with Alabama or 50 players who can compete with Ohio state. I I'm not, it's not casting aspersions on our football players and the effort they put into it or anything else. We can get, we can get guys in. We've had Thomas Jones and Chris Slade and we, you know, and, and lots of guys like that, but having 50 guys like that is not going to happen at Virginia. And so anybody out there who thinks, oh, yeah, we can win, we can go 12-0 and 0 and, you know, get into a playoff and play Alabama in the championship game is delusional. It's So seven or eight or nine, the occasional season where you make a run, yes. And then otherwise, let's have seven as the, as the floor. That's realistic. But, you, you know, obviously John Oliver, 
uh, offended people by just telling them what's real. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and Carla Williams has said recently, and, and Tony Elliott repeated it, is that they are thoroughly convinced that you can have a winning football program at a high, high academic institution. Well, uh, we've we've seen that it, it's possible. Um, George did it. Al did it for a while. Um, London did it for a year. Uh, <laughs> Bronco had two years. <laughs> Bronco had two years. He had one year where he went to the Orange Bowl. Yes. Which not many, not a lot of programs get to the Orange Bowl. Uh, but you know what does it take? I mean, can you can you consistently do that at an high academic institution. I mean, Duke did it last year. Duke is a ranked higher in academic world than Virginia is. And they, what, they won 10 games they last won 10 year, games, I think, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, with less material than Virginia. Oh, like, yeah. The Their coach got time. fired the year before. Our coach just quit. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so they had a new coach who was under consideration here. So um, I guess you can, I guess you can do it at a, a at a, a really good academic but institution. That's one season, though. Yeah, um, but can he, you do it consistently? Stanford had that run. They had Jim Harbaugh, and then when he went to the NFL, the first couple years of Shaw, where because Shaw had a good run until the last two years, but yeah, that that, that couple years overlap of of Harbaugh and Shaw, maybe there's a four or five year period when they had Andrew Luck, where they would win you know twelve games a year. But since then, you know, they were three and nine the last two years, and Shaw's out, so. Even Stanford, which had a you know a three or four year run, can't sustain it longer than that. So, uh, and that's the most recent of of the. I would count. I would put Virginia, what Virginia, Stanford, Northwestern, Duke, as as the four, and maybe Vanderbilt. But Vanderbilt never wins. Vanderbilt, yeah, yeah, they, they never win. I don't, I don't know where Notre Dame stands in that, but uh... yeah, they they yeah they 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 can they, they compete so well that, that I wouldn't even put them in that realm, even though academically they they might fit in that realm. Of those, of those other schools, though, no one has, uh, you know, no one, no one wins consistently. No one is a perennial contender anywhere. They're, they're academic schools that play football, occasionally win, mostly don't win. Yeah, so um, I, I guess it's, it's that old uh, Missouri slogan, show me. Show me. <laughs> can, can you do it? Well, all right, show me. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's, yeah. Let's hey, I'm, and, and now that all said – yeah, we would be very happy if Virginia uh, got to a twelve and zero and got to a playoff. There's a the, the, the playoffs expanding to. That'd be to fun to cover, man. I'd love to be writing about that every week. <laughs> oh man, yeah. The, there's the, it's expanding to twelve teams in 2024. We have to wait one more year. Um, I think I, I've been I've been rooting for a expanded playoff to twelve teams at least, just because I knew I've I've known since however I've been able to, to put thoughts together that Virginia would never be in a four team playoff, but twelve. There's a chance. So um, Tony Yelly's got a couple of years to get ready for that. But but no, other than that, uh, it's it's yeah, it's tough. It's tough. Now, the basketball program different. We we may have a very busy travel month next month, Jerry, if if yes. this team keeps playing the way it's playing. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, I mean 2019 was uh, so much fun. It was exhausting, uh, but it was fun. I mean, I think we were in. Uh, well, the ACC tournament that year was in Charlotte. Uh, that's right. That's right. And then, and then we went to Columbia, I think, the next week. And yes. then we went to Louisville. And then we went to Minneapolis. So yes. uh, that was a uh, a month on the road, essentially, for us. And, uh, and then uh, – Enough I, time to come home in between and book the next trip, basically. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I, I'll I, – my son and I drove to all those locations uh, because of his situation, but uh, I was even more exhausted after that uh, Final Four trip than any of the dozen Final Four trips I had made in my my lifetime. So, well, then we decided to write a book for the next month after that, so that kept us pretty uh, tired as well. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was uh, – by the time all that was over, as much fun as it was, I was sick of basketball. <laughs> <laughs> if things work out the right way this year, uh, it would be – you know, this this is the perfect scenario. It, it, the Final Four is in Houston, I think, this year. 
Uh, the so Greensboro for ACC tournament, Greensboro for first two rounds of NCAA tournament because that's that's a possibility. Uh, then New York for Sweet Sixteen uh, and fi- Elite Eight, and then and then to Houston. So it would maybe be a little less travel because New York's only a six hour drive. Uh, yeah, Greensboro three three hours. So we could we could do that. It'd be a little easier this year. That would be that would be a lot easier. So. <laughs> Well, uh, I, I, the, that drive to Minnesota is still, I, I don't know if I'll ever do anything like that again. I think that was like 20 hours of on the road. Uh, and that was, that was brutal. 20 hours. Yeah. And you, you guys made it quick. My wife is from Minnesota and she had to go home after nine 11 for a, actually a family death during the time when planes weren't flying. And they went as they went together. All the Virginia people went together, and it was a twenty-six hour drive. So when you told me it was twenty, you got to, got, got there in twenty hours. Like, Maybe wow. it was twenty-six. I don't know. I, I lost track. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just. I was thinking, is man, you guys cut like a third of that trip off. That's. I, 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 I want to ride like with you I guys. Was, I felt like I was in the twilight zone by looking at <laughs> <to> that drive. <laughs> and then you got to come home afterward. That's even harder. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, now Jerry, as we're wrapping up here, we ought to thank the sponsors who helped make this all possible. Oh, absolutely. Uh, we couldn't do it without them. Um, the Aberdeen Barn, the best steakhouse in Virginia. Um, I've had so many memorable meals there over my career at, here in Charlottesville and uh, dining with ACC people and UVA people and uh, uh, all the greats have been there. You, you're liable to see anybody from UVA in there from yesteryear. Great atmosphere. Uh, great food, great service. Uh, also, uh, the Good Feet store, uh, tremendous people. Jonathan Cotton does so much great uh, community work with Ronald McDonald House and uh, sponsoring uh, various events over at JPJ. You, you saw him uh, with some uh, half-court shots and stuff like that for $10,000 if anybody made it. Um all kinds of cool stuff, giveaways. Um, he's an NIL sponsor for some Virginia athletes. So um, go by and see them at the Good Feet store at Stonefield. Um, you got any kind of walking, running discomfort. Uh, they have foot arches that they specially designed for your foot uh, to relieve any problems you're having and, and give you comfort. Uh, great people to work with. And uh, our our newest uh, sponsor is uh, a, a, a great clothing store that right here in Charlottesville, Roback, R-H-O-B-A-C-K, uh, named after the the sweet little doggy here. We all, who doesn't love dogs, right? But uh, I've been wearing their clothes for uh, a month now and uh, Great looking clothes, comfortable. Uh, I don't want to take them off. Hats, they got hats, they got hoodies, they got uh, Q zips, one of my favorites. Uh, they got some of the best looking clothes and most comfortable clothes you can you can ever uh, uh, want to have in your wardrobe. So, uh, and they have a women's line that has opened up too. It's sportswear and uh, comfort wear. So. Um, go to our website, look, uh, look on it. And all you got to do is click on their ad and use the promo code UVA Jerry, and you'll get a generous 20% off of your first order. And, uh, that helps us helps, uh, Kia Clark and, and, uh, helps UVA. So, um, and it helps you because you're going to be one of the best dressed people in town. So uh, check them out and uh, thank, thanks to all of our sponsors. We appreciate you. Yes. Thanks to all the sponsors. Thanks to the folks listening in today. Thank you for your time. Thanks to Jerry. Hey, thanks to Ben Vanderplas. That was great having him on the show today. Uh, and if you uh, want to check things out, go to jerryratcliffe.com, go to augustafreepress.com for Jerry Ratcliffe. I am Chris Graham signing off. Everyone have a great day. <laughs>